Thanks, Mark. I mean, I think all of us, were, that was a fantastic overview. Um, and there's so much in there for, for us to get our, our, our teeth into. Um, we have, we're slightly running over, but we'll take 15 minutes for um, questions. I'm sure there's lots of questions, lots of comments. Um, if you want to ask a question, if you just raise your hand, please say who you are and if you want which organisation you, you're here to represent. Um, I'll maybe take two or three questions and then we'll, we'll put them to Mark. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. If you just wait, if you just wait for the, the microphone to come, because we're recording it. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Ian Halstead. I'm from LNP, um, and I just wanted to ask Mark, how are you, uh, I presume you're giving this talk to the financial community as well as the um, ethical or the responsible investment community. How are you finding the response uh, from the financial community side? Are they taking it on board? Is there... Is the message seeping in, or, or are they remaining somewhat oblivious still to the, um, the whole matter that you're raising? Uh, thanks. Thank, is this on? Yeah, thanks for that, Ian. Um, well, we found that the, 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 the response from the investment community very, very positive. I, I, I do mostly investment presentations and seminars for big asset managers, um, people like Legal and General and BlackRock and Hermes and other big fund managers. What they want, uh, what the two things come up really. One is, is, is tell us more about um, what happens to the fossil fuel sector during the period of transition to a low carbon future. Where are the risks? Um, a lot of questioning around demand for fossil fuels, whether these projections given by the companies are right. So um, our paper lost in transition was really setting out nine points about how the oil and gas industry is misreading demand for, for, their, for their products that will lead to bad decisions. Uh, so a lot of questions around that. Um, we, we, we have a sort of separate parallel conversation with people about corporate governance, about the governance of boards, and how do we get fossil fuel company boards aligned with two degrees as a target. Um, I, I was amazed. Last week, we, we, we were asked to do a conference call with a very large Dutch bank that has a substantial commodities and energy business. It's a sort of household name bank, and we had the global heads of energy dialing in, and I was, you know, surprised by, by that level of kind of engagement. And um, I think probably um, most people now reconcile that you can't achieve these climate goals whilst, ex whilst expanding the fossil fuel sector. And some of the banks are really worrying that actually they may, may end up with projects which are, you know, um, they'll end up on the bank's balance sheet as, as, as un irrecoverable debts. Uh, because they'll never, they'll never be developed. And a lot of people are concerned about the risks. I, when I put, so I'm just kind of, I, you know, just the founder, but when, it, when I put in the global head of oil and gas for HSBC, who's sort of now in retirement, put him and some of the top analysts up against the other analysts, it's a very, very different conversation to the one I've given today. It's very technical, very detailed, um, and uh, I've not had anyone really challenge the fundamental basis of what we're saying. Gentlemen, halfway back there. Uh, Heather Kirby, Clark Jordan, Echo Village. Mark, that was a, an absolutely fascinating presentation. Thank you very much. Do you think at all about the impact of the transition from a distributional point of view? It seems to me there are huge issues here. One can imagine in the scenario that we're going to see again fossil fuel prices shooting through the roof. Uh, and uh, what happens to, I can think of so many poor people, elderly people, whose heat comes from uh, fossil fuel-based systems who don't have the capacity or the knowledge to invest in changing over to renewables. H how do we manage this transition in a way that's just and that doesn't cast the burden yet again on the most vulnerable and the poorest and the most marginalized in our societies? Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I think probably what we have to have is a system, I think I've, I talked about it earlier, moving from centralized energy generation to local generation to distributive power um, and to where and I, I'm a director of a wood pellets business which is, is competitive with 
with kerosene and people have been using wood pellets instead of, of um, um, uh, oil fuels in, in their heating system. So I do think it's, it, it is possible. What you would, we're really talking about is switching, the cost of switching from a fossil fuel-based system to a renewable energy system. And there, some governments have taken leadership by putting in subsidies to, and incentives to replace old boiler systems with fuel-efficient boiler systems or clean, clean energy systems. Um, but the task is enormous, and I think this is one of the, the, the dilemmas we face, is how do we make the transition without causing problems for people that, that suffer from what, what is quite rightly pointed out, fuel poverty, which is a tremendous problem. But we can then look at it from a developing world's point of view. And if you come onto Carbon Tracker's website, um, we're often told by the coal industry, and we heard the mantra, coal solves poverty. And what they're saying is, is that developing countries need coal because coal gets them to industrialize will then get people out of poverty. And, um, we really kind of address that. I, I don't think it's plausible in that context to see Africa covered in large transmission lines carrying electricity from one side of Africa to the, uh, to the other. I don't see that being economic at all. And that what people will actually do is build village level and household level mini grids, off grid systems, which actually renewables is an awful lot cheaper than fossil fuels. It's cheaper to put a solar system on your roof in, in, in an African country than to put to connect up to a coal-fired power station. And of course, if, if, if um, um, coal solved poverty, Af South Africa's had coal for, for the last 50, 70 years in abundance, but I don't see it really doing much for poverty in that particular country at all. So there's issues of equality and access um, as well. Um, I, I think you've probably highlighted one of the, the dilemmas which runs through is so what choices do we make? Do we, do we um, maintain a system as we have it now, uh, or do we, are we more concerned about the future risks of climate catastrophe? And I'm, 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 I'm moving towards the, we're probably going to have to bite the bullet, take some difficult decisions now, rather than leave it to the next generation to deal with our mess. And you'll let the front here, and maybe I'll take two questions if the, the other lady at the side there. Uh, Finola Finn from Throat so um, thank you very much, um, Mark. Uh, I suppose I was brought back to Eamon's comment at the beginning about greed, not polar bears. And I suppose, I mean, the economic argument seems quite strong. And I was just wondering your comments on, you know, um, it's sometimes very hard to promote the uh, moral argument. And I suppose as, as a church agency, we have been campaigning hard on that. Um, but I suppose there's a lot of self-interest. And I'm just wondering how you marry those two and, um, and how, how, how you bring that forward. Um, it, it seems that it will be a much more compelling argument for, for uh, communities who are interested in their own pockets and, and in their own future economically. And I suppose the second thing I was just wondering in terms of um, futurists, you talk about managing that the orderly transition um, by the fossil fuel companies. And I'm just wondering about, again, given the, the arguments that you presented there in terms of the economies, how many of them are doing future scanning are, and are preparing to change? And are there any good examples of those that are making some sort of a, um, an orderly transition or attempting to do that. Okay. We'll take the final question and then we'll go to coffee after this. Uh, Casey, Gil Casey Aspen with uh, Queen's University Belfast. And my question is about the fossil free divestment movement and what you say to an institution that says, you, you know, our funds are commingled, we use tracker funds, and when we look into the alternatives of low carbon indexes, they're very liquid. And, you know, it's difficult for us to deconstruct a commingled tracker, you know, uh, assets that are tracker-based. So what would you say to those who are resisting the low-carbon index alternatives that are available? Okay, so I'll take that last question first. Um, there are others in this room who are going to be coming to the panel that will address those questions. Um, people are creating easily accessible products that allow people to make the switch to low carbon or no carbon if they want to. And often what we have is um, fund managers and trustees that are just not, putting, not willing to put the work in to make the move, even when the options are there, uh, or pre present themselves with um, insurmountable reasons, uh, often bureaucratic as to why they can't make the moves. Um, and for low-cost trackers, uh, my understanding is, it's, is actually there should be no penalty exits and, and no fee entrances. That's one of the benefits of, of tracker funds. 
probably, and I've worked in, in you know, the financial sector for, for you know, 25 years, uh, I've seen so many reasons for people not to do things and to hold things up. Um, but if that's your experience, I want to say something, is that that's the experience of many, many university endowments and faith groups around the world. I get, I get news service coming in every day from, that tracks all the news stories, and what you've just described is a conversation you'll hear in Canada, in Australia, in America, in New Zealand. Everyone is coming back with the same comments. Um, and a lot of university endowments and others have broken through and actually found solutions. But it, it has to be driven by a will and commitment to find the answer. But others will comment on this later. Um, on the f sort of the first question about the financial arguments, um, I'm conscious I'm speaking at an investment event. Uh, if you sat in to a number of the presentations that uh, I've done with colleagues at Carbon Tracker where we make no moral arguments or any ethical arguments, we've just gone straight for the financial arguments about the challenges of companies in transition. What happens if your business model is wrong? It's not implausible for oil prices to recover, and I do see the potential for oil prices to recover. Um, but over the long term, I think that the downward pressure is greater than the upward pressure, and the downward pressure will come from fuel efficiency. It won't be called climate. It will be fuel efficiency standards. It will be electrification of car fleets. It will be hybrid cars. Um, it will be a whole range of other factors that will reduce demand. And very small changes in demand for oil, and we saw this in the last two years, have led to huge changes in price. So just 1% or 2% changes in demand for oil has led to 50%, 60% drop in, in, in the price of oil. So it's highly sensitive. And investors are very conscious of, of companies now um, getting these choices um, wrong. So here is the question you actually asked is, are there companies making that transition? Now, there's some, like Total, the French company, which is the world's largest solar company. It's inside an oil company. And others are trying to, to develop and think about alternatives. But many of them have left it too late. And I think culturally, culturally, um, the boards, particularly of oil companies, employ engineers who like to build large pieces of engineering equipment and plunk them in the middle of the sea or some other difficult, and that's what they like to do. To then ask them to become a company that builds solar panels, which is a very different discipline, uh, it's a transition too far. And we, have, we forget that actually BP used to be known as Beyond Petroleum, um, and Shell and, and BP had large solar and renewable energy businesses, and they got rid of them. Why? Because their shareholders told them to get rid of all this peripheral nonsense and just focus on your core activity, which is producing more oil and gas. What I actually think should happen is the boards should put themselves into, into wind down and run off. And I think that instead of using shareholder funds and profits to do new projects, they should pay these out as dividends, double the dividend, have a huge cascade of cash coming out to the pension funds over the next 10 years, don't do new projects, and use the pension funds use that money then to find and invest in the next Teslas and the next solar cities and so on. And that the oil companies shouldn't pretend that they're going to become solar companies. I think they've left it far too late to do that. And if the boards are the wrong... So if a company is... The management wants to take you in the wrong direction, there's one thing you do. You've got, you've got an election coming up here, I think. Um, is it a few, few weeks away? Next week? week. Next week. Well, what happens is if you've got one group of leaders you don't like, you, 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 um, you vote them out. Um, I think we're getting to the point where we're going to have to start voting out directors of um, oil and gas companies and putting in new directors, ones who are going to align us with this two-degree target. Um, and it's going to require um, banks and other pension funds that we have here in the room uh, to actually agree that that's the right thing to do for citizens and for policymakers and, and to sweep away the boards of these companies and put in place people who will actually manage their decline and, and stop this sort of nonsense of going out to grow and grow and grow um, as if, you know, the planet could absorb all these emissions and it can't. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I won't try to sum up any of what Mark has said. Maybe just a, a few thoughts that have, have kind of stuck with me from his presentation and the discussion. I think you've really shown with Carbon Tracker how a small acorn can become an oak tree in terms of the, the, the influence that the... the um, the carbon tracker and the, the, the analysis is, is, is really having on the broader divestment movement and, and markets. Um, I think you've given us a lot to think about, about strategy and tactics in terms of insider, outsider, the kind of, um, the kind of uh, arguments that we need to start to use with different audiences. 
I think that the whole thing about divestment by choice or by value destruction has really stuck with me. That if you accept the science, then you're faced with the choice of or some kind of orderly um, uh, transition or value destruction and everything that, that goes with that. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the apartheid movement. It's very much part of Chokra's history and the engagement with the anti-apartheid movement. Um, and I think that's really, in my view, what we're looking at in, in terms of the scale of what's, what's needed. Um, and then I think what really, I mean, the, the slide that stays with me most is, is that the three circles and the bubble and the fact that that green circle of the, the space that's available um, is so small relative to even what we know already in terms of um, the, the assets that are there. So the paradox that that presents us with as, as society, as, as, um, as humanity. So I think you've really set up the discussion for us. We'll go to coffee now. Um, take advantage of getting to know people because there's people here from very different uh, parts of, um, I guess, who are engaged in, in the issue of fossil, free di fossil divestment from very different perspectives, from the financial sector, from the churches, faith groups, NGOs. So take a, do take opportunity to get to know people. Um, and we'll see each other back here for our panel discussion, hopefully in 15 minutes or so. Thank you. Thank you.